Hey there, y'all. Time for an Art Gibbs Vidlays. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Celtic art. Why? Because many visual motifs that are very relevant today in contemporary society can be traced back to Celtic art, even when we are not really aware of these Celtic roots. To give you the historical overview, this timeline shows how Celtic art, depicted here in various green tones, actually has several distinct phases that cover nearly 2,500 years of history, before, during, and after both ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. Especially interesting for us is the Hallstatt culture, which not only is found in Hallstatt, Austria, but it stretched out all over our own Styrian region. Later, I'll show you some treasures found just south of us in Sumtal near Leibniz. The Roman Empire conquered the continental Celtic tribes, except for Asterix and Obelix, of course, and even a large portion of the British Isles. But they could not militarily conquer portions of Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. And there, Celtic art, which had already been developing for way over 1,500 years, flourished. When Christianity began to spread across Ireland, Due to the missionary St. Patrick, according to legend, the existing Celtic art and Druidic spiritual tradition was appropriated, that's a fancy word for to steal, and fused into Catholic theology, blossoming in peaceful monasteries into the Celtic aesthetic known as insular art, before being wiped out by invading hairy bands of Vikings who sacked and looted everything they could leading to the infamous Dark Ages of European cultural dearth. Now, what we know of Celtic art is largely based upon what has survived. Here we see on the left and center two examples of Celtic sculpture that suggest that the Greco-Roman tradition of anatomical mimesis, that is, the imitative representation of life, like you can see on the work on the right, was not so important for these Celts. Yes, the people are called Celts. The adjective is pronounced Celtic. Don't ask me why. And no one knows why the Celtic sculptor gave that dude in the center such massive legs and skinny arms. We do know that ornamentation played a different role and a much more important role in their culture than in today's. In contemporary culture, ornamentation is often regarded as being superficial decoration. One reason for this is the boundless quantity of ornaments and ornamentation that surround us every day. Modernism is grounded in the opinion that ornamentation is simply aesthetic clutter that has accumulated over the centuries and needs to be thrown away right now. Entire genres of art from hard edge and color field painting to minimalism, spurn anything that is not essential. But imagine yourselves back 2,000 plus years in history, far removed from the high civilization of Rome, Athens, or other large cities. Such an object seen here was a very rare treasure, and such Intricate craftsmanship took months, if not years, to achieve with the hand tools that artisans of the day had at their disposal. The cult wagon of Stretveg, also called the Stretveg sacrificial wagon or the Stretveg chariot, is a bronze cult wagon from around 600 BC, which was found as part of a princely grave of the Hallstatt culture in Stretveg near Judenburg, Austria, in 1851. In Großklein, just south of Graz in the Sumtal, the most significant finds from the Hallstatt period, now this is early Iron Age, 800 to 450 BC, the most significant finds in the southeastern Alpine region were discovered, including a mask and hands made from bronze from a princely tomb. Back then, very few individuals had decorated objects at all. The torque left a female version beside a male one in the middle, was a highly prized item worn by people of high rank. 
the floral organic design on the shield on the right, we see later in history numerous times in Art Nouveau, for example. As well, the dynamic geometric patterns on the back of the smear. In fact, geometric patterns are widespread throughout this time in history, all over Europe, from Scotland to Greece, as well as in faraway continents such as Mexico or Turkey. One of the foremost treasures of Celtic art are the illuminated manuscripts. According to the archaeologist Catherine Jones, common to Celtic art over a wide chronological and geographical span is an exquisite sense of balance in the layout and development of patterns. Curvilinear forms are set out so that positive and negative, filled areas and spaces all form a harmonious whole. Control and restraint were exercised in the use of surface texturing and relief. Very complex curvilinear patterns were designed to cover precisely the most awkward and irregularly shaped surfaces. This aesthetic grew, in part, by virtue of an unbroken Celtic heritage lasting in Ireland from before and throughout the Roman area of Britain, which had never reached the island. One significant example is called the Book of Kells, made around 800 AD, which contains the four Gospels of the New Testament, along with other texts and tables. It is appreciated even today as a masterwork of Western calligraphy and represents a pinnacle of insular art in particular and of Celtic art in general. It was written on vellum, a kind of prepared animal skin or membrane, also known as parchment and is still considered to be one of the most enduring of materials. 1,200 years ago, the process of making parchment was very expensive in being both time and labor consuming, and therefore used only for the most important of high quality productions. The Book of Kells is now housed in the Trinity College's old library. Now's the time to take a short break, get a snack, something to drink, do some push-ups, Run around the block, juggle some snowballs, cut your hair, whatever you do to relax for a bit and come back in five, ten minutes. You can press pause now, because I'm not going to wait for you to come back, okay? Now, we are going to focus upon one important element of Celtic art known as the three-chord plate. Plate is another word for braid, and braids are found everywhere around us today. Many of you have friendship braids that you have made or traded with friends. They look nice and colorful, as well as remind you of how your life is woven together with your friends. Hair braids not only look nice, they can be very practical too, keeping long hair tidy and out of the way in a beautiful way. Rope serves primarily a utilitarian practical role. When braided thickly enough, can even bear the immense weight of a huge sailing ship tugging at its anchor in a storm or fastened to a dock. Rope has also been used as a metaphor to help us realize how communities work for the benefit of all. An individual alone, like one single strand of twine, is weak by himself. But together with others united in purpose, then we are strong. Maypole dancing still takes place in certain areas as a visible reminder of how a community is woven together, a network of people and families who can help each other out in times of hardship, as well as celebrate together when the holidays roll around. For earlier generations, maypole dancing was also one of the few public occasions where young women and men could interact and flirt in public. What do you see here? I see a table corner whose wooden frame has been carved to reveal a braid pattern running around the outside edge. This is odd in a way because the earlier examples showed braids resulting out of individual strands being braided together. Here, the artisan has taken solid wood and carved out the braid. It's beautiful, and I'm sure it took a long time to finish. It's not very practical, though. 
Imagine eating bread over that table and all of the crumbs getting caught in the holes between the strands. Evidently, the aesthetic look and the symbolic meaning of the braid was more important than practicality. Here is another example of a braid pattern being used. Individual strands of wool have been knitted in such a careful way so as to let a braid pattern emerge. This technique was developed for several reasons. Distinct patterns were often used by certain families to identify themselves. Also, when knitted so intricately, the sweater becomes thicker, providing more insulation, and it's therefore warmer in winter. Here we have an image that takes the braid to a different level of meaning. This tattoo does not serve a practical function, but it certainly has meaning in terms of aesthetic and identification. If you look closely, this braid also presents something that our previous examples did not. Look at one strand and try to follow it as it weaves its way through the other strands. It looks as though this is just one strand woven back and forth upon itself. In other words, it is an endless braid, which has its own little history. One aspect of Druidic spirituality that we know of is the belief that everything is connected. Christian theology appropriated this belief into its notion of the divine trinity, the three-in-one identity of the infinite God the endless braid with no beginning and no end, that seems to be many, yet is one. This motif was soon adopted by the church as an important visual element that wove spiritual meaning with that of community and beautiful aestheticism. The Book of Kells shows us even more examples of how monastic artists employed visual images to convey spiritual meaning. In this detail, you can see four heads of what look to be worm-like creatures. A larger one wraps around three smaller ones whose heads are seen frontally and whose bodies are chaotically jumbled and knotted together. In contrast, the large outer creature has a clear profile and a body identified with an immaculately precise endless braid. For the Catholic Church at this time, they understood this larger being to be the monastic life that provided a secure fortress of order and clarity that consumes the chaos of human whimsicality. That's what they believe. But the Vikings thought otherwise. Now we have reached the end of input and the beginning of your task, which is quite simple. First, take a piece of A4 unlined white paper. Ordinary copy paper works or a blank page in your art book, and position it in landscape orientation. Second, take a pencil and, drawing freehand without using rulers or guides, try to copy the three-strand braid pictured now. Try to be precise, but don't worry about it if your drawing turns out all wobbly and irregular. More about that next time. When you're done drawing the braid, Document your drawing and upload. That's it. You're done. Feel free to press pause on your video player now until you are done. And until next time, take care of yourself and don't leave home without your Ganathic mojo.